legendary. It means something that is remarkable enough to be famous or well known. There are characters who linger in our thoughts long after we've turned off the game and stepped back into reality. It's as if you've been sharing your journey with a close friend, fighting battles, solving mysteries and celebrating victories together. Then the screen goes dark and you find yourself wanting to talk to them, to share one last moment. It all came flowing back to me when one of my closest friends found himself with some extra free time and decided to give Red Dead Redemption 2 a try. As someone who has experienced the game's powerful narrative, I could anticipate the emotional roller coaster he was about to embark on. As he shared his thoughts, feelings and images from the game, I couldn't help but smile and wish I could experience it for the first time all over again. Reliving this experience through my friend's eyes rekindled my love for the game and inspired me to share my thoughts on why this experience will always stay with me. And it all comes down to the soul of the story. Arthur Morgan. As we're thrust into snowy grizzly mountains, we're put in the shoes of one of the outlaws in the 1890s, Arthur Morgan. He's part of a gang that is desperately trying to run away from the law after a failed robbery back in Blackwater. The opening serves as a reunion between Arthur and the gang, as he wasn't part of the Blackwater job and has just caught up with them. All we know that we have lost people already, and the only thing that matters right now is to escape. If you and Dutch talk about how we're gonna get out of this, I was just discussing with Herr Strauss when the weather breaks. I suppose we'll have to keep heading east. East? Into all that? That civilization? I know. The west is where our problems are worse. Come on, Herr Strauss. Let's get warm. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. It doesn't take long to get a grasp on the key dynamics in the gang and what role Arthur plays in it. Dutch Vanderlyn, the charismatic leader, his deep thoughts and paternal care for his quote-unquote family show that he's more than just a criminal mastermind, he's a man with a vision. Hosea Matthews, the voice of reason, he serves as a counterbalance to Dutch's impulsivity, offering a more cautious and thoughtful perspective. His long-standing friendship with Dutch is evident and it's clear that he's one of the few people Dutch listens to, although not always. Micah Bell, the unpredictable instigator, a newer member of the gang who is eager to prove himself, but whose reckless behavior is a cause for concern. Sadie Adler, the strong survivor. Although initially not a gang member, Sadie's introduction sets the stage for her transformation from distressed widow to a strong, independent member of the gang. Abigail Roberts and John Marston, the struggling family. Through snippets of conversation and interaction, it's clear that Abigail is concerned for the well-being of her son Jack and the somewhat estranged partner John, who you might remember if you played the original Red Dead Redemption. Additionally, there are characters like Bill, Javier, Charles and even Uncle who play smaller roles, but their personalities provide a general idea of the gang's diversity and daily life. And lastly, Arthur Morgan, the loyal enforcer. He's Dutch's right-hand man. Loyal, tough and dependable, but not without a moral compass. His interactions with other gang members show that he is respected, if somewhat feared. And outside the gang's home area, we quickly discover where this fear comes from. Oh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> but I'm not a good man, Jimmy Brooks. Not usually. You see, I was in Blackwater. I kill people. And maybe I should have killed you. Should I have killed you, Jimmy Brooks? Me? I never saw you. Not, not now, not, not never. I think we have an understanding. Of course we do. Jimmy Brooks. <laughs> I will remember that. I've got a good memory. The intimidation, weight, and conviction behind his words will straight up give you chills down your spine. The delivery of the character leaves no doubt of why he is the right hand of one of the most notorious outlaw gangs in the West. This is a man who is used to getting his way, not through erratic violence, but through calculated intimidation. Be it debt collection, train robberies or interrogation, he's the right man for the job. 
Arthur is the big brother of the family who will beat up anyone who hurts you, or in this case, intimidate and take what the gang needs at the time. Where were we? Where's my friend, buddy? I, I, Come on, speak! He... he... Hey! Hey! No! No, he's, he's in a cabin! Down by Braithwaite Manor! Near the cornfield! Thank you. It's important to note here that this isn't something new for Arthur. He has been with the Vanderland gang for more than 20 years. He was the third member of the gang after Jose and Dutch himself back when he was just a teenager. And let's be clear, talking and thinking is not Arthur's strong suit. He's not the strategist, he's not the planner, he's the enforcer. He believes that violence should be cold, necessary and without feeling, and never out of personal enjoyment or without reason. And you get to decide just how extreme Arthur is in his role. Now would you get rid of all of this? The train? Yeah, get it out of here. What about them? What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> it's up to you. Kill them, leave them here, take them with you on the train. Just make sure they don't send no folk after us. Okay. See you back at camp. But while Arthur's raw power and blunt force methods are stunning in their own way, they're only one stroke of brush in the complex portrait of who he truly is. Much like a painting would be boring if it was just in one shade of blue, Arthur's character is enriched by layers that we get to see as the story unfolds. One of the first layers of this early on is when he receives a letter from Mary Linton, a woman from his past, asking for his help. The letter is already a clue to a side of Arthur we haven't seen yet, after all, he's a man with a past filled with relationships and regrets, just like all of us. Not merely the hardened outlaw we know today. I need your help. You mean the family that always looked down on me? And you want me to help? It's my little brother, Jamie. <laughs> well, I always liked Jamie. At least compared to the rest of them. <laughs> he's broken daddy's heart. Daddy has a heart. Don't make me beg you, Arthur. My money, my life, me. I wasn't good enough. I'm sorry. We need your help real bad. After this short interaction, it's clear that Mary is not just any woman from Arthur's past. She's a lost love that didn't work out because of the difference between their social standings. If you can call being an outlaw a social standing. It's also clear that Arthur has capacity for genuine emotion and vulnerability and it is not limited to only Mary. You see, another aspect of a big brother is how they always look out for their younger siblings' well-being. And we can see it on display through interactions with characters like Lenny on a night out drinking or with John Marston's son, Jack. Would you do something with Jack? He seems kind of down. All this upheaval can't have been easy on the poor kid. Why? Because I'm your preferred nursemaid? Because he likes you and, well, you know his father's useless. Okay. Arthur is not a two-dimensional character we often see in video games. Just because he knows his role and does it well, doesn't mean he enjoys causing violence or hurting people. In his eyes, he's doing what is necessary to provide for his outlaw family. And in the late 19th century, living as an outlaw, what is necessary can extend to quite a lot of things. Without him performing in his role, who will provide for the children and women in the camp? There's no one else to count on, just himself, and that's what drives Arthur to do what he believes he must do. Before jumping on the high horse to say there must be a better way, ask yourself what lengths you would go for, for your family or loved ones. If we're being honest with each other, we know that it would be much further than what the law actually allows. Arthur embodies this uncomfortable truth. He serves as an example of the belief that the ends always justify the means. This nuance keeps us from viewing him as unlikable. Or in other words, he's an anti-hero we root for because we understand his motivation and context. This is especially true when we learn about someone truly despicable, Micah. Fail, but when I fall, I don't want no fuss. When you fall, there'll be a party. <laughs> <laughs> <Well, pardon me. laughs> Probably. Uh -huh. That's funny, huh? Sure. <laughs> I don't feel like being laughed at by the likes of you two. Stop it! Now! 
even though Mike can be overlooked at the beginning as just an annoying prick, it doesn't take long to see that the bad in him runs a lot deeper. Both him and Arthur are experienced criminals who are part of the same gang, but they couldn't be more different. Micah is a vile, pathetic, dishonest human piece of garbage who has no trouble brutally killing anyone for any reason, including women and children. It's not too far to say he actually takes pleasure in needless violence. His presence in the gang and the story serves as a contrast to Arthur, whose actions are always based on necessity. The interaction between these two characters was always like trying to make fire and water coexist peacefully. The best way to summarize the difference between these two can be like this. Arthur brought muscle, Micah brought chaos. And although Arthur does not enjoy Micah or approve of him being in the gang, he never abandons him. That's how much family means to him. He will protect even those he despises. Sons of Dutch makes us brothers. <clears throat> Sometimes brothers make mistakes. And family they are. The camaraderie and care for each other comes through especially during celebrations or gatherings in the camp. But before we continue, I feel obliged to warn you that in order to truly unpack Arthur's character, I will need to cover some of the main story and its twists. Please consider this as your spoiler warning. So, what's your plan? Well, we'll see if we can track him, but we might need to lay bait to draw him out. Bears like fish, obviously, but they also have a sweet tooth. A lot of fellas bait then shoot from the trees, but I prefer to hunt on the ground. More dangerous, but we'll have a much better chance of getting a good shot in. And if he bolts, we can start right off after him. One of my favorite relationships in the gang was between Arthur and Hosea, one of the two father figures he had while growing up with a group of outlaws. When Arthur is with Hosea, we see a man who is willing to learn and absorb wisdom. Hosea is older and has a different perspective on life, and Arthur respects that. They share jokes, reminisce about the past, and understand each other in a way that Arthur doesn't with many other gang members. This friendship adds a layer of warmth to Arthur's character, and since Hosea often serves as a counterbalance to Dutch's idealism, Arthur is able to share his reservations about Dutch's plans. This shows that Arthur is not just a blind follower, he has his own doubts and worries, which he is more than willing to express when he is with someone he truly trusts. In conversations with Hosea, we often see Arthur reflecting on his past, his choices and his future, giving us a glimpse into his internal emotional landscape. And while we are on the topic of father figures, we can't go past the other side of the coin, Dutch Vanderlyn. And now we are stuck! East of the Grizzlies and out of money, and a long way from our dream of virgin land in the West. I know, my brother, but we are safe. We make a bit of money here, then we move again, head out around them, be west of Uncle Sam, in a few months, buy some land. I hope so. Would you just look around you? This world has its consolations. Dutch, the charismatic leader of the Vanderlyn gang. As Arthur's mentor and father figure who raised him, Dutch plays a crucial role in Arthur Morgan's character development throughout the story. But at the beginning, we see him as a man with a vision for a better life, a life free from the constraints of a rapidly changing society. Dutch is the reason why Arthur has a strong moral code despite their outlaw lifestyle. And as one of the first members Dutch recruited into the gang, Arthur develops a sense of loyalty and trust in his leader. And Dutch's influence doesn't stop at Arthur. Every single person in the gang has his back. He didn't recruit mercenaries as members, instead he recruited outcasts of the society and gave them all a place to call home. I don't want to kill all these folk, Dutch. Just you. In that case, it'd be my honor to join you. Excuse me. Friends, I have an appointment to keep with. I think your new friend should leave now, Dutch. You're making a big mistake, all of you. <laughs> yeah, dreadful. We have got something. Something to live and die for. How awful for us. Mr. Milton, stop following us. But as the story progresses in Chapter 3, three notable dynamic shifts happen within the gang. First of them is the evolution of Sadie Adler, going from a girl that survived a bandit attack, which left her husband dead, to a woman that challenges the female standards at the time and becomes a strong fighter that can handle her own in a fight. And she proves that right next to the main enforcer of the gang, Arthur. 
Yes, we, uh, Mrs. Adler did okay. At shopping? Yes, at shopping. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Don't mention it. I would ride with you again, Mrs. Adler, if you will ride with me. Maybe. <laughs> if you prove you can handle yourself. Well. The second shift is a pivotal moment in the story when Arthur is captured and tortured by a rival gang of Driscolls during a mission where Dutch is trying to ease the tensions with them in a diplomatic manner. When Arthur manages to escape and return to the camp on his own, it shakes the gang's confidence in Dutch's leadership. While Dutch may have good intentions, his judgment comes into question. It also deepens the growing division between Jose and Dutch. Jose is openly skeptical of the truce from the beginning, and the disastrous outcome only vindicates his caution, casting further doubt on Dutch's increasingly aggressive and reckless strategies. It reinforces the existential threat the gang faces, not just from law enforcement, but from rival gangs, making it clear that they are far from invincible. Arthur! Arthur? Arthur! I told you it was a setup, Dutch. Oh, my boy, my dear boy, what? They got me. But I got away. Yeah, yeah, you did. Miss Grimshaw, I need help! Reverend Swanson! He's gonna set the law on us! Oh, of course he was! I'm sorry, Arthur. It is a bit late for apologies. And lastly, the attack on Braithwaite Manor, where the gang tries to rescue Jack, who's been kidnapped, only to find out he's been sold to a crime lord, Angelo Bronte, in Saint Denis. If the previously mentioned fractures in the gang could have healed over time, this made them deeper and permanent. It brings to the surface existing tensions within the gang, particularly regarding Dutch's decision making. His rivalry with the two families has now escalated to the point where a child is in danger. While they are united front to face the danger, it also heightens the internal scrutiny and stress, further putting Dutch's leadership into question. In a way, Jack's kidnapping serves as a mirror held up to the gang, reflecting the real costs and consequences of their outlaw lifestyle. The gravity of the situation adds a layer of desperation, as now they're not just fighting for some abstract sense of freedom or a better life down the line, they're fighting for the immediate safety of one of their most vulnerable members. This event humanizes the gang in their own eyes, making them question whether their ends justify the means approach is truly acceptable, and laying the groundwork for the ethical and moral dilemmas that are yet to come. In my opinion, this is the moment when the story shifts from being just an adventure tale to a deeper, more nuanced exploration of responsibility, community, and the moral complexities of life on the run. In some ways, this also signals the beginning of the end. Where's the boy? My sons gave him to Angelo Bronte. So my guess is Saint Denis. Either there or on my boat to Italy. Let's go! Arthur, come on! <laughs> what are we doing with her? Leave her! Unsurprisingly, this incident serves as a personal turning point for Arthur internally, who begins to entertain doubts about the path the gang is on and the man leading them. As the story shifts from countryside troubles to the problems of the new quote-unquote civilized world where outlaws don't belong, we get a few moments where Arthur can escape the reality of his situation. One of the most notable ones are the experiences he shares with Mary Linton, who has reappeared back into his life after he helped her, showing us a part of Arthur we don't see so often. You came! Yeah, I came. <laughs> so, uh, what do you need? Wait there! I'm coming straight down. Arthur. Hello, Mary. You came. Sure. Whenever you call for me, I'll come. And even though it's not meant to last, the details and nuance of their romance made it feel real. They both clearly love each other, yet are unable to make the jump required to actually be together. Unpacking this complex romance story properly would require a video on its own, so let me just say this. I believe it's significantly harder to pull off an emotion just through characters' eyes or body language in video games when compared to live-action movies, but this scene did it better than most films. You can see the exact moment when Mary decided to let her love for Arthur go, knowing it will simply never come true. Is it too late for us, Arthur? I can't lie to you. I want it, man, Mary. If I, if 
anyone close to me. Well, they wanted to, and I can't have you wrapped up in there. But it's coming to an end. This time it really is. Run away with me, Arthur. Run away right now and don't look back. I want to. More than anything, I want to. But I've got some people I need to take care of. Once they're free, then I'm free. Then I can disappear. But Arthur... If we're gonna run away anywhere, we'd need money. Soon, I'll have some. I know you won't run away. But it's a pretty dream. But there was never enough time for romance, as Dutch's once well-laid plans had become more erratic and chaotic, and we can't discuss the evolution of Arthur without touching on the downfall of Dutch. His vision of living free from society and its rules was always pretty and fit this little group of outcasts living on the outskirts. But once forced to adapt after the kidnapping of Jack, his approach simply became more heavy-handed. This incident posed a serious threat to the safety and unity of the gang, two elements Dutch had always promised to maintain. His reaction to the kidnapping shows signs of his growing desperation and the unraveling of his confidence and control. Dutch's charisma and lofty vision about freedom and a better life start to lose their shine, exposing the self-serving and increasingly unpredictable and violent nature of his decisions. In his dealing with Angelo Bronte, we get to see it on full display. It's as if a line had been crossed and he's turning into a ruthless animal who's backed into a corner. What are you gonna say now? They are even bigger fools than you. No doubt. The law will find you. Already, the dogs are on the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're right. You are so right. They are good at smelling filth, huh? So uh, filth has got to be disposed of. Uh, Our uh, friends of uh, uh, it gonna come and rescue you, you uh, repulsive little maggot. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, uh, call them now. You call them! Jesus! What part of your philosophy books cover feeding a fellow? The goddamn alligator, Dutch! The part that covers weakness. And if the signs couldn't be more clear of the times changing, they arrived crystal clear in the form of two dead bodies, Lenny and Hosea, during the bank robbery in Saint Denis gone wrong. This instance serves as a watershed moment for the main story, gang's dynamics and Arthur's view on Dutch. Hosea has been Dutch's closest advisor and moral compass for years. His level-headedness often balances Dutch's impulsivity, and his death leaves a glaring void in the gang's leadership. And Lenny was a promising young member of the gang, whose loss further signifies the falling apart of the family-like structure that the gang once had. These deaths come as a direct consequence of a heist that Dutch insisted on pulling off, despite the escalating risks and the mounting tensions within the gang. Dutch! Get out here! Get out here now! Someone must have squealed. Never should have gone after Bronte, Dutch. Mr. Milton? <clears throat> Let my friend go! Or folks, they are gonna get shot unnecessarily! Your friend? <laughs> Why would I do that? Come on, Milton! It's over. No more bargains. No more deals. Mr. Milton, this is America. You can always cut a deal. I've given you enough chances. Come on! Dutch's actions and inactions during and after the bank robbery make it evident that his priorities have shifted or perhaps simply been revealed for what they really are. No longer the charismatic protector of a chosen family, he begins to seem more like a desperate outlaw willing to sacrifice anyone and anything for his grand and increasingly unrealistic visions. The once untouchable Dutch is now subject to open criticism and doubt especially from Arthur and John Marston. But the criticism doesn't come immediately, simply because there's no time for it. Instead, half of the gang is forced to escape right after the bank robbery on a boat to Cuba of all places, or at least that was the intended destination. What are we gonna do in Cuba, Dutch? Hold up for a while, then hurry back, gather up the rest of our family. At least we got some money now. Money and loyalty. With that, you can do whatever you please. So you reckon they'll follow us to Cuba? 
Like Colonel Waxman on a jolly? I highly doubt it. I reckon we hold ourselves to ourselves, and this is done and dusted. Let's hope so. I ain't no sailor, but, uh... <clears throat> that cloud look like good news to you? You know how there's a saying about a certain moment after which people are never the same? Kinda like, Clay was never the same after he moved to Europe. In most cases, it means something tragic. And in the case of Dutch, Warma served as the grave where the charming, caring and supportive Dutch found its final resting spot. His ability to make rational decisions diminishes, which is manifested in his reckless engagement with local politics on the island, even though the gang's primary goal should be to escape and return home. And the face of the new Dutch couldn't be more apparent than how he dealt with the guide who was helping him. Dutch? What are you doing? Jesus! Crazy Dutch! What was that? Horrible old crone. But you killed her. She was gonna betray us, Arthur. Couldn't you tell? No. Well, I got some Spanish. She was. You keep killing folk, Dutch. I am just trying to make sure that some of us survive, Arthur. Nah. This action shows a clear departure from the Dutch we knew earlier in the game, who at least tried to justify his actions with some form of moral or ethical reasoning. It also adds to increasing tension between Arthur and Dutch, and it's clear that Dutch is becoming more ruthless and less predictable. The act is brutal and seemingly unnecessary, and it showcases Dutch's descent into more violent and reckless state of mind. It's a moment that signifies a real turning point in how Arthur, and by extension you, the player, view Dutch. So how did you know she was gonna betray us? What'd she say? It was in her eyes, in the way she was leading us. But you said you knew Spanish. I know human beings, Arthur. <laughs> Are you gonna strangle me next? I'm doing the best I can. Returning from Guarma and looking for signs of the family and where they might be gives us a moment to reflect on all the craziness that has happened and how grim the future prospects are. Not to mention the deaths of Hosea and Lenny that seem like a lifetime ago now. But returning to Saint Denis with heavy doubts is not the only thing Arthur carries. It's something that goes beyond the gang's situation or power dynamics. In this moment, faith forces Arthur's hand to not look only at the leader of the gang, but to look at himself. Okay, now here. Breathe. Again. Yeah. Let me see your tongue. Now say ah. Ah. What is it? It's not good news. Well, I guess that. You got tuberculosis. I'm really sorry for you, son. It's a hell of a thing. I remember refusing to believe that Arthur is going to die and thinking there must be something that can help him or someone I could give these thousands of dollars I've earned through hunting or finding buried treasure. There must be something. Unlike me, Arthur accepted the fact that his time is numbered and the clock is ticking. Instead, we get to see how the doubts he had before and have only taken shape as vocal comments are now becoming actions. We lent Arthur some money, you see, and... So it was you. You son of a bitch. What do you want now? You want my boy's shoes? You want the food out of our bellies, what little there is? You want me to lie down for you? No, no. I... Arthur gave everything to pay your bills. Everything. And now there's some fellas coming to take the house. I uh, just wanted to say the debt's canceled and to uh, take this. It won't bring your husband back, I know. You need money and I don't. These acts first take place outside the gang in various interactions where Arthur absolves debts, protects the weak, or simply does morally sound things. But they find their way into the camp little by little. And one of these moments happens when Arthur returns from an unsuccessful debt collection mission and decides to put an end to money lending schemes led by Herr Strauss. How did you get on, Mr. Morgan? Just then. Hmm. Just... Get up. What? Get up! What? What is wrong? Nothing's wrong. Nothing at all. What are you doing? 
Something I should have done a long time ago. Get your bag. Is this it? I don't understand. I ain't gonna kill you. Oh, I probably should. You disgust me. And you shame us. If we could be shamed any more than we already are, that should do. Go! I don't understand you. What are you doing? Go and get a job! It's worth mentioning here that you as the player get a choice here as well. You don't have to perform these acts of kindness. You could proceed as a brutal outlaw. Instead of having this change of heart, a much darker route is an option. But that simply never sat right with me. It just didn't feel like Arthur. Potentially because of these acts of kindness, or more likely because there's not much time left for Arthur, his voice becomes stronger against Dutch, as he doesn't only see himself more clearly, he also starts to see Dutch for who he really is now. It's a slow realization that Dutch doesn't care for the family anymore, and only Arthur can fill these shoes to ensure the safety of the gang to some extent. Those oily enactors of a mediocre justice, the Pinkertons, and their benefactor, the depressing millionaire Leviticus Cornwall, they... They want us, Arthur. They want us. And they are going to have us. Well, maybe they ain't the problem. Meaning? I don't know. It's just... Well, I can't help but feel we would have been better running off someplace else. <laughs> but the, the game ain't over, Arthur. I mean, I ain't, I ain't played my, my final move, but... I guess I'm more interested in saving lives than winning at chess. And maybe life ain't such a thing to cling on to so tightly. No doubt. What about the women? You sound like Hosea. I miss him. As we progress with chapter 6, another curtain is pulled back on Arthur's character during this transitional time, when he assists Native American chief Rains Falls to recover a sacred relic. As they ride through the mountains, Arthur shares how he used to have a son, and how he tried to provide and protect both the son and his mother while keeping them out of his outlaw life. I had a son once, years ago. Don't talk about him much. No, oh, what was his name? Isaac. His mother, Eliza, was a waitress I met. When she got pregnant, she knew who I was, what my life was. I didn't want to promise nothing I couldn't keep, but I said I'd do right by them. Every few months, I'd stop by there for a few days. He was such a good kid. She was too, I guess. <laughs> Just a kid, 19. What happened? I got there one day and saw two crosses outside and I knew right away. Turned out some bastards had come through, robbed them, and shot them dead, and offered $10. It hardened me, feeling that kind of pain. But I know now that you don't get to live a bad life and have good things happen to you. This man has lost so much in his life, and yet he has taken a lot more life. In his own words, you don't get to live a bad life and have good things happen to you. And Arthur is very apparent in the clarity of this truth. He doesn't seek forgiveness of his actions. He simply wants to do what he believes is right with the time he has left. And even though it's an optional mission, I believe Arthur is returned to Edith Downs and her son Archie to help them escape prostitution and reach for a better life after he was the one who partially killed their father shows us exactly this newfound clarity. <laughs> oh, you're a silly boy. Oh, Archie, what oh, we do? Get out of here. Go. Live someplace else. Start over. Here. Take this. I don't need it no more. I don't want your money. Yeah, I know you don't want it. I don't. You sure as shit need it. Take it. No. I ain't looking for forgiveness. It ain't about that. But don't forgive me. Just take the money and get out of here. Please. I know I ruined your life. I suffer for it every day. But don't let yourself get killed for, for pride. I've seen it kill too many folk. <sighs> don't say anything. Don't thank me. Just take the money and pack your bags. That's... All I gotta say. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. I said don't thank me. 
Although Arthur's health keeps deteriorating, going from a cough here and there to a full-blown coughing fit on the ground, sunken eyes, heavy breath and significantly less strength, his acts of kindness grow bigger and stronger and he becomes more aware of his true nature now that his time is almost out. He doesn't really share what is happening with him or seek sympathy from anyone in the gang, but when Sistan Caldreon refuses to believe he's a bad man, there's a moment where Arthur's walls come down and he shares how he truly feels. But I still don't believe in nothing. <laughs> Often neither do I. Huh? But then I meet someone like you and everything makes sense. <laughs> You're too smart for me, sister. <laughs> I guess I... I'm afraid. There is nothing to be afraid of, Mr. Morgan. Take a gamble that love exists and do a loving act. All aboard! I believe it's easy to take fear of death at face value here. In my eyes, Arthur is not afraid of death itself, but the future where the family he grew up with would fall apart. And above all else, he's most afraid he won't be able to protect those he loves the most in their time of need, simply because he won't be alive anymore. In essence, this is Arthur actively seeking redemption through his actions, and as he proceeds through it, his relationships with different gang members are put to the test. The more obvious ones like the one with Micah are on their last legs, while others are more surprising like Charles, who sees the change in Arthur and believes in him. He supports Arthur and stands by him in this time no matter what. You coming, Arthur? I'm gonna try and save him. This fight is unwinnable. You go and distract them and let me get to him. Have it your way. The rest of you, ride with me. Let's meet up at the factory. Let's ride! Yeah! Go with him. Try and help there. I'm better off alone. We're riding with you. Come but with Hosea gone and Arthur going through his change, it's no one else but Micah that we can see becoming closer with Dutch as his trusted advisor in future plans that Arthur is now left out of. Instead of finding new family members, the gang size is increased through Micah's buddies that are simple mercenaries for hire. Instead of rescuing John from prison, Dutch is spending time thinking of how to make more money while being halfway convinced by Micah that John is a traitor. Instead of tensions in the gang, we see a complete split now. One side is siding with Dutch, even though he's a mere shadow of his former self, while the other side is siding with Arthur, who still stands for the values Dutch has abandoned now. Instead of waiting for Dutch to give orders, Arthur takes action and decides to free John together with Sadie. This act of defiance leads to a moment between Dutch and Arthur, where their decades-long relationship reaches irreversible breaking point. What do you think? It sounds wonderful. Hell, yeah. I ain't got much to lose, but... You know, the women and the children. And John and his family. I'm afraid I have to insist. I mean, we gotta let them go, because if the Pinkertons come through again, they will kill everyone. John? Insist? Yeah. Insist. It's very likely that this is the very first moment where Arthur, the good, loyal, but above all else, obedient goon in Dutch's holster, has stood up against his plan. And you can see the love for Arthur quickly vanishing from Dutch's eyes. This pivotal decision highlights Arthur's commitment to protecting those he cares about, even if it means defying the man he once considered a father figure. Arthur's unwavering determination and willingness to sacrifice himself for the greater good demonstrate the extent of his character's transformation. As the gang's situation grows increasingly dire, Arthur, not Dutch, becomes a beacon of hope, resilience and selflessness in a world consumed by greed and violence. And this ultimately reveals how Arthur's new type of actions are finding their way back in their camp. He won't betray Dutch or the gang, but he won't ignore the road of self-destruction they are on Arthur doesn't mind dying on it, but he makes the decision that John and his family need to be saved from it. Since both Arthur and John joined the gang when they were young, I believe Arthur sees him like a little brother. And as the big brother, he can give him a chance to not lose his way, his family, or the love of his life. Like he did. Like I said, John, when the time comes, you go. What about loyalty to, to everything? You've been loyal. I've been loyal. Look what that cost. 
You know, all that ever mattered to me was loyalty. It was all I knew. It was all I ever believed in. Well, not anymore, John. Soon, you gotta go. Go. Don't look back. As we're about to reach the climax of the story, Arthur eventually confirms his suspicions of Micah being the rat that sold the gang out at every possible step along the way. And even though Arthur has clearly shown that he opposes Dutch's new leadership approach, he returns to the camp to warn him, just to see his words never reach his once dear friend. I just saw Agent Milton, Dutch. Abigail shot him. She's okay. Not that you care too much about that, you rats. All of you. Seems old Mike was pretty close with Milton. What the hell are you talking about, cowpoke? You talked. That's a goddamn lie. Dutch. Dutch. Think of the future. Milton told me. <laughs> and you believe him, Black Lung? You believe him? It all makes sense now. No. It damn well doesn't. Dutch, think. Dutch, be practical now. At the very end of Arthur's story, his character is never abandoned. He doesn't give a grand speech. Instead, his actions show us precisely how much he has changed. And he gets the redemption he never thought he could gain and lay down his life for something he truly believed in. To stay behind and let John and his family escape. And trusting John with his own hopes and dreams. We ain't both gonna make it. Go. Now. I'll hold them off. It would mean a lot to me. Please. There ain't no more time for talk. Go. Arthur. Go to your family. Arthur! Get the hell out of here and be a goddamn man. You're my brother. This act of sacrifice is the ultimate expression of Arthur's redemption, as he finally puts the needs of others above his own. He did his best, and he gave everything he had. He shows us that even when our choices are constrained by circumstances, even when the road ahead is filled with uncertainty, there's always room for courage, for kindness, and for love. Arthur once said he wanted to die facing the west setting sun so he can remember all the fine times he had with the gang, but instead he died facing the rising east, symbolizing the man he had become throughout his journey. As the story transitions to the last act, with players continuing as John Marston, the true impact of Arthur's character becomes even more apparent. No matter what you do in the game or in your everyday life, whether it's going to work, school, or simply carrying on with daily routines, there's this sinking feeling in your stomach, as if something was missing, someone was missing. Arthur's influence doesn't end with his death. In the game's epilogue, we see how his actions and sacrifice continue to shape the lives of John Marston and his family. John strives to build a better life for himself and his loved ones, and it's clear that Arthur's selflessness and determination have left a lasting impression on him. The choices Arthur made in his final days directly contribute to opportunities and challenges that John faces in the epilogue, serving as a powerful reminder of the enduring legacy Arthur has left behind. Arthur. Arthur saved my life before he passed. I don't talk about him much, but I think about him. Me too. There are characters in video games that we like, characters that we love, and then there are characters that touch our very souls. And so, Arthur Morgan stands as one of the most complex and captivating characters in game history, if not beyond. His journey might be a tragic one, but it's also profoundly human, filled with moments that range from heartbreaking to uplifting. It serves as a reminder that even within the brutality and chaos of the outlaw life, 
There are opportunities for redemption and humanity, something that all of us can learn from even now. And that is the enduring legacy of Arthur Morgan. He's more than a character. He's someone who felt alive, real, and most importantly, he left an impact on me through this experience that I will never forget. Thank you guys so much for watching. It was a crazy journey to put this video together. If there are more characters you would like to see um, such a video on, please let me know. Apart from that, have a good one. Bye.